Well, I bid you all a warm and always, as always, a sincere welcome to this time that we have once again to look at God's word, um, praying that it will be a blessing to you and a blessing to me. Um, we thank God for the week. Uh, I pray that your time this week has been well spent with the Lord. I pray you have known the Lord's help. I pray you have known the Lord's leading. I pray you have known the Lord's saving grace if you've come to him for the very first time in faith in Jesus Christ. In all of these things, my friends, we look to the Lord, our God. Uh, and, you know, he speaks to us so much in his word. Um, and, and then the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 92 that no matter what, we should say it is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to his name, to declare his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness every night. I do pray that we are those uh, here this hour who could say that about the Lord our God. Well, let's come now to him in prayer. Let us pray. We do thank you, O oh Lord our God, for every moment of life that we have, for every moment of blessing, to thank you and praise you for the week that has passed, to thank you and praise you that that hand has sustained us, that you are a God who is faithful every night and who blesses us every morning. You are steadfast in your love, steadfast in your grace, steadfast in your mercy. Oh Lord, help us to be steadfast in our faith to the God who has given us everything. Oh Lord God, let us set this day, this hour, our lives before you and dedicate it to blessing your name, to being obedient to your word, to loving and following the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, our soul, our mind and our strength, to give you the glory in good times and in bad, to remember the wonderful promises that you offer to your people, that you are a God who never leaves nor forsakes, Oh God, we, we need you every hour. And we pray, oh God, that even this hour, we will know your presence, that you will meet with each and every one of us, wherever we may be. Or you may meet us at our point of need. You may supply all your riches in grace through Christ Jesus. That we will remember that we are those who are heirs, who love the Lord, the heirs to your kingdom, that we have prepared for us a room, that we are striving towards a crown that is laid up for us. Oh Lord God, may you help us that even in the trials of this life, we can look forward to the blessings of that which is to come. That even in the trials of this life, we can remember the blessings that we have now in our lives in Christ that in him all things will always be well. Uh, through the love, the hymn that says, of Christ my Saviour, all, all is well. So God, may you bless now this hour, bless every pulpit preaching your word in spirit and in truth. May every man know your grace and your leading, and may it be now for us a time of rejoicing as we once again seek out these wonderful truths that you give to us um, to help us to live day by day ever closer to you. Be with those who are struggling, especially at this time. And may even in this um, small hour that we have, um, they be refreshed uh, uh, and re-energized and reminded, as all of us, of what a wonderful and glorious, loving, graceful, merciful God you are. We thank and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. <clears throat> well, my friends, uh, we are still uh, in Kings. Um, not many more to go. I think at least one, although um, I've been reading through it and thinking maybe more, but we'll, we'll certainly, I think, be looking at one more of the stories of this uh, prophet Elisha, um, but we are now in, in, in Kings again, chapter 6, um, 
and uh, we, we're going to read. But before we read from verse 8, just a reminder that we've been looking over the past weeks at the life of this uh, amazing prophet Elijah. What a mighty man of God he was and how we see that in encountering Elijah and speaking to Elijah, this great prophet of the Old Testament, people are in fact dealing, when dealing with the man of God, they are actually dealing with God. And we've seen um, the joy that Elijah has had and we've also seen, I'm sure, the sadness that Elijah has had with Gehazi, his servant. Um, last week it was the floating axe head, wasn't it, from 2 Kings, again, this chapter 6 uh, and verses 1 to 7. Uh, and it's a reminder again of the, the darkness of the time that Elisha um, lived. Uh, and he, yet we, we saw that even though um, times were not great for the children of God, his ministry was growing. And if you remember, the sons of the prophet said, that, you know, our space isn't big enough, Elisha. We need to uh, build more. C will you consent to go, to go with us? So my friends, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know that even at times of famine, God is at work. Even in small fellowships where you wonder uh, when a new face may arrive, God is at work. Even in those times when we don't seem to see conversions and baptisms, God is still at work. God is at work. God is always working and God will always be working. And it's a real picture for us of Christian service about when trials come, when troubles come. And these servants said to, to Elisha, uh, um, please consent to go with your servants and do we ask remember the comparison we had do we ask the lord to go with us um so if you turn in your scriptures now i hope you're already at uh, two kings chapter six we're going to read uh from there in verse eight through to verse the end of verse 23 8 to 23 of 2 Kings 6. And we read the words of God to our hearts. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? So basically what had been happening is that the king kept of, of Syria kept making plans on how he was going to attack Israel, but Elisha kept through the power or through the revelation of God kept warning the king of Israel about Syria's plans. And now the king of Syria is sure there was one, a spy in his midst. So he calls them and he says, will you not show me, there in verse 11, which, will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? Verse 12, and one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, that is, Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the words of Elisha. 
Now Elisha said to them, <clears throat> this is to those soldiers, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and, that, and, they, and there they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and bow? Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And so the band of the Syrian uh, raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Amen. Well, once again, we see here, do we not, my friends, um, Elisha going about his daily business working for the Lord. And, and it's, it's, it's a clear enough story. One day, uh, it's a disciple who had got up early uh, on this particular morning, this unnamed servant comes out of the house and he looks and he sees what is described here in Scripture as an army. And I was trying to envisage what the servant saw. And it must be difficult for us to, to envisage what the ser servant saw. We come out of our houses in the main and we look and we see other houses. Um, but... but where Elisha lived, there must have been this unrestricted view um, of all the, the surroundings, this panoramic view. He must have had a view of, of everything, 360 degrees around. Maybe where they lived was on a hill, we don't know. Maybe it was slightly down in a valley. Um, but what we do know, uh, and what we don't need to uh, speculate about in any way is that the servant, this unnamed servant, had unrestricted visual access to what was around him and what he saw caused him great distress. And, and interesting to see that the, the same, it's the same sort of language that the servant uses here, that the son of the servant, the sons of the prophets used earlier on in the same chapter. So we, we have this, this uh, servant saying in, the, in, in chapter 6 and at verse 5, when he was cutting down the tree, the, when the iron, the axe head fell into the water, um, he cried out saying, Alas, master! Alas, master! Why? Because he knew that the axe head was borrowed. And here in, in 6.15, we have the same sort of language again where he, he says to him there, Alas, my master, what shall we do? This servant sees it as a helpless and a hopeless situation. The city is surrounded, there's horses, chariots, a great army, we are told. This is no small thing. What shall we do, he says. And my friends, there are times, and, and, and you know, this chapter six really helps us in, the, in, the, in our helplessness because there are times when we can feel utterly and totally helpless. It can be times, my friends, maybe even right now, um, as I said, I've said previously, uh, I do not know everyone's situation, but God knows. And maybe right now that it may be that one of us here during this hour is going through something that, that is, is causing us trial and tribulation. It may well be that one of us has no faith actually in Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. And the question to us this evening, my friends, is that when he says, alas, when we have those alas moments, what will we do. Because that's the question, isn't it? Alas, my master, what shall we do? What do we do? What do you do? What do I do? Dear Christian, if you're a Christian this hour, how often can we feel, as I've said, overwhelmed by the task that God has set before us? And more and more, 
I tell you, dear child of God, it can feel like the, the world is more and more against us. Uh, it becomes more and more godless. London, uh, this area around the church, sometimes it seems that we're literally surrounded uh, by armies of different kinds, but they're all pitted against us, like pitted against the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we love and whom we can proclaim. And the pressure doesn't stop with us older ones, there's the younger ones as well. When you think about school, when you think about colleges, uh, you think about all the exam mayhem over the past year and the troubles and the, and the anxiety that is causing uh, when they're thinking about planning for university. Maybe you're at university or maybe you're just finding a new job and you're seeking a new job or maybe you're in a new job. What about the workplace? What about, my friends, as I've mentioned before, our family members? They can often be the places of the greatest anguish. That sibling that doesn't want to hear, that parent that doesn't want to hear. And in fact, because they are family, they sometimes can often react more um, vehemently against what you say or what we may say as children of God than a stranger. It's quite easy, isn't it, to, to feel that sense of helplessness, to feel that sense of loneliness. Alas, my master, what shall we do? What are we going to do? And I, and I direct you to Elijah's response there in verse 16. So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Three things, my friends, I want us to uh, see and to learn from this wonderful uh, statement of truth from Elijah. Three things that I pray by God's grace will enable us to walk closer with him more and more each day. Uh, using uh, the first thing what I want us to see from these three things when we're feeling maybe overwhelmed, when we're feeling maybe despondent, when we're feeling that sense of powerlessness, is to look to the strength that is afforded us through this word of God, the Bible, and the words that are used here by Elisha. And the first thing he says here is, do not fear. Do not fear and, and and we have to stop it's not just a a prelude to everything else that he says he actually makes a great statement there and we'll i think we the best thing to do is to use other areas of scripture to open as it says up this this phrase to unfold these phrases like opening a suitcase is we open it and we take out and we unpack the great truths that are within this one little phrase. So this is the first thing we, I think we should see. Do not fear. One of the first um, portions of scripture that uh, uh, jumped out to me was Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 41. We're going to do a little bit of Bible jumping. Um, not too much, but enough to keep us busy. So Isaiah in, in, in chapter 41. Uh, and those words that the Lord speaks to um, uh, uh, there through, the, through his prophet. He says, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you, from, um, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. My friends, when the Lord tells us not to fear, it is for us to have faith 
and to believe, irrespective of our situation, no matter who is set against us, no matter who wants to fight us at every corner, no matter what situation we may be facing. We are safe, says the Lord, and we are secure, says the Lord, in his loving arms. Think also of Exodus, Exodus 15 and of verse 6. Exodus at chapter 15 and at verse 6 we read these words. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose, rose against you. Don't, says the Lord, be afraid. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, verse, uh, uh, chapter 5, of verse 11, when he's in that great sermon there on the mountain. He says, blessed are you when they, that is the world, that is those who are against you, when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Isaiah knew of this. Elijah knew of this. Uh, Elijah knew of this. Elisha knew of this. Uh, Jeremiah knew of this. The prophets knew of this thing, my friend. But in all those cases that we see, in all the cases in the New Testament, in all the cases now, today, 2021, God says through us, through his word, through the, the words of his servant here, Elisha, do not fear. If you are in Christ, says Jesus, you are blessed. Those who are with us, says Elisha, are more than those who are with them. Think of Deuteronomy again, chapter 31 and verse 6. My friends, there are so many wonderful portions of Scripture where we pull out this great message of do not fear. Be strong, it says in Deuteronomy 31, 6, and of good courage. Do not fear or be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. My friends, what great wonderful promises we have in do not be afraid, do not fear. Uh, but we know that we can sometimes be afraid. We know sometimes the spirit of fear can overcome us. And to overcome it, what we are being told is we need to trust in God. To overcome it, we need to love God completely. And once, the, 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 through these words, we can see that once we learn to trust in our God, we will no longer be fearful of the things that come up against us. It's such a wonderful place to be in a walk of faith, my friends. And I say to you who do not know the Lord, what do you hold on to when things come against you? Oh, if there's no God to hold on to, we're left floundering. There's no foundation. Oh, my friends, come to Christ, for in him we can be those who can listen to his word and no longer be afraid of the things that come up against us. Remember the psalmist, in the confidence that he has, in his knowledge of God, in his walk with God, he says in Psalm 511, let those who take refuge in you be glad. Let them sing forever with joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. It's something that we need to hear so often, my friends. What a year. It's been a full year since this whole thing really got going concerning COVID here in this country. We're not, my friends, oblivious to the way of the world. Oh, uh, we know uh, where the way the world operates. And we who know the Lord, my friends, will have these times when our faith is tested. We'll have these times 
when we will have uh, elements of fear. God knows this. And that's why he says so many times in the scripture, uh, fear not, do not fear, do not be afraid, be courageous, be strong, know that I am. God says this. Why does he need to say it so many times? Because he knows our frame. And he knows that we are dust. But even the prophets, my friends, had to be reminded. These great men of faith who proclaimed his word, who God spoke to in times past, he used them to speak to the people, but he spoke to them and he used them. They were his instruments to declare his word. You know, he spoke to them directly. Uh, We read this so often in the scriptures, yet even these great men of faith had times of fear. One of them that, that, that jumps out and I often quote is, 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 is Habakkuk. Is Habakkuk. Remember him. He saw, didn't he, Habakkuk, um, the nations, the heathen nations um, prospering. And he saw God's people suffering. And fear had gripped him. And he, he, he became almost lost as to see, couldn't see a way out of what was going on. It was a real burden on his soul. And, and, and it, the opening of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1, it says the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. And then he had this great question for God, didn't he? Oh Lord, he says, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear then you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law, he says, is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Uh, The wicked surrounding the righteous is the situation that we find here in 2 Kings 6. And in essence, what Habakkuk is saying there, the cry of Habakkuk is the same. He's saying, alas, master, what shall we do? What shall I do? He's crying out to God for an answer to this this question that he, he, he has. And even the great prophet Elijah, Elijah's, Elisha's predecessor, the one to whom Elisha said, I need a double portion of your of a blessing. Elijah, remember, if you know the story, my friends, I've encouraged you um, over the past weeks to, to catch up through Kings, the story of Elijah and Elisha. And if you have been doing so, you remember uh, where Elijah um, had to deal with those prophets of Baal. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite amazing there in, in, in chapter 18. Um, they're on Mount Carmel. He stands, he's a one man, he's a one man standing, on a, standing against a virtual army of prophets, false prophets of Bear. Uh, and he has the confidence of the faith, not only to challenge them, but to even mock them in their belief. Uh, in a false god. And eventually he orders their deaths for their actions because God vindicates his servant. But then the amazing thing is after that great display of faith, what happens? Oh, after that great display of confidence in God, what happens? You read the story, my friends, because what you will find is that he runs like a scared rabbit almost when threatened by the wicked queen Jezebel. You read 1 Kings 18 and 19 and you'll see it. In the end, God has to come to him and say, what are you doing here? My friends, it is not for us to be discouraged in times of crisis. And there's been times of crisis. There's a time of crisis right now. But we are shown that we are only human. And God knows us. And even the strongest in faith can have real moments of weakness. But like Elijah, when we are faltering, the Lord's intentions is always to strengthen his people. 
It's to bring us back once again. You know, if we look at 1 Kings in 19, um, he, he, he wants to, to do that. In, in, in verse 9, um, there, Elisha escapes from Jezebel in chapter 1 Kings 19. Um, and he runs from Jezebel, as I've said. And, and then in verse 9, he went to a cave. Uh, this is Elijah. He's hiding, isn't he? The night in that, and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? In essence, he's saying to him, Why are you hiding? Hey, he said, and, and Elisha answers him, he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. But it doesn't answer the question as to why God said, what are you doing here? His faith was faltering, but God said to him, no, no, you go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And he went out and stood there before the Lord. And the Lord showed him um, his presence, as it were. The Lord passed by a great strong wind, tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, the earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That's what Elijah hears. He hears God's word. And the voice came to him and said to him again, What are you doing here, Elisha? My friends, in essence, God wants us to get on with that God-given task which he has given us. What, how do we answer God's query if we are one that are struggling with faith? And God said, we're in essence hiding. Uh, and God says, what are you doing here? How do we answer? This year, in truth, my friends, has been a, a strange year, an abnormal year. It can be an anxious time. It can be an anxious time just to get back to where we were before it all started. Everything seems so different. So many things now are done remotely and online. So little is done in person. People could be anxious about meeting people again and engaging in proper conversation again. Soon we're going to have this opportunity, by God's grace, to, for, for us to get back in amongst each other, to physically get back, as it were, to the tasks that God has given us. What does God say to us? Do not fear. Don't worry about all these things, these great changes and things that happen in your life. If you are one who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, this very moment to you, I tell you, my friends, that the place of refuge given to those who are his, the place of safety, that place of strength to stand and not be afraid, that, that place that he has where he says to them, do not fear, he offers to you as well this very hour. We're to listen to this word of God. This word that it says, and do not fear. That's the first thing, my friends. The second thing, and these second and third points would be much shorter. The second thing is to see that this word that comes should bring faith. It's words in action. It's faith in action. Faith allows the one who believes to see things differently to those in the world. Faith makes a person rely on God. In Isaiah 26 and at verse 4, we're told, Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, in Yahweh, the Lord, is everlasting strength. In the translation of that, he is the rock of ages. You know that great hymn, rock of ages. Cleft for me, let me do what? Let me hide myself in thee. Faith makes a person, you see my friend, see his or see her own inadequacy and, 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 and the, the need that we have a heart of sin. Faith makes us see that we can have this, this wonderful great exchange where we give the weakness of ourselves to God and he gives us his strength. 
We give our sin, as it were, through Christ to God, and he gives us uh, his son's righteousness. This is what we see, my friends. Proverbs, uh, chapter 20, and at verse 9, we're told these wonderful words. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Who can say it? Who can say it? But what we are seeing here in verse 17 of, of 2 Kings uh, 6 is that uh, Elisha shows us he, uh, that if you ask the Lord, God is always willing and God will always act. Look at the simplicity of his words. He prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. This is what God wants us to do when uh, we, are, we are in this place of fear. Even though he has told us not to fear, he wants that word that reminds us not to fear to bring us to him in faith. That word brings faith. We're to go to God. All men, all of us in our natural state are guilty sinners. We're fallen. All of us in our natural state are far from God. All of us have no desire for God uh, in our natural state. We have no intention of acknowledging God. Uh, we're on a pathway that takes us away from God. And this is, this, we say this, and we can say this with great thankfulness to God, but we are to remember this in terms of others. Because we were all walking that path until the Lord Jesus Christ in his mercy met with us and called us to himself. And our greatest prayer should always be that he will do the same for those in our families, for those who are our friends, for those who are strangers, for all who come through these doors, for all who listen online, for the entire world. Would it be something if the whole world walked with God? No uh, had a desire to seek after God. The whole world knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their risen Savior. Uh, when we're to remember, there but for the grace of God, when we look at those in the world, go, I remember Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2. He says there in verse 3, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. We all once fulfilled the desires of the flesh. We all once fulfilled the desires of our mind. We were all once, by nature, children of wrath, just as the other people. But then he goes, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, but God, my friends, and those are hope. Now, how much I love that. Those two words. It's the most wonderful two words in my heart for this scripture. It is God who is so rich in mercy that he opens the eyes of us who were by nature blind. It is God who is so rich in mercy that he enables us to see the wonder and the beauty of Jesus Christ. It is God in him opening our eyes which allowed us to see him through faith which makes us, me, you my friends, if that is us this night, boys, young people, uh, all of us, we can see him and we're saved by his grace so that we can say no condemnation that great hymn now I dread Jesus and all in him is mine alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine and knowing this being convinced of this having this great desire and knowledge of the Lord we can now say bold I approach the eternal throne and we can claim that crown through Christ, who is our own. The word brings faith. Elisha trusted in the word of God. He believed and he knew his God. And we have the opportunity, the same opportunity, my friends, especially if you don't know God, to be reconciled to God. And we are reminded by 1 John 4, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And God desires that belief, repentance, my friends. God desires that uh, uh, confession in Jesus Christ so we can abide in him and he in us.
as he does in all who believe. Isn't that the, the thing that should convince us this, this hour? That we have God himself abiding in us. So we can now, it, it, it is, my friends, as it were, remembering all of these things. If you are a child of God, I say to you this night, child of God, this is the words being echoed here in 2 Kings. 1 John 4.4 4 tells us this, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's the echo of these words that, that Elisha says here, doesn't he? To his servant when he says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. It's the same thing. We're to have this eyes of faith. We're to be seeing and having uh, uh, this faith through spiritual eyes. You see, the servant had fear through his natural eyes. He stared out and all he could see was his great army, uh, the great Syrian army spread around him, all around him. But as Elisha prays, uh, God opens his eyes to see the reality of faith in him. That's faith, my friends. That's how Hebrews tells us. Being sure of the unseen, not the unknown, being sure of the unseen, because God has given us his supreme revelation in the word of Jesus Christ. God, who at various times in, in our men's, in our, our, our study, digging deeper, we're looking at the book of Hebrews, and we just touched on these first four verses. God, who at various times, in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, who had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than angels, as he has obtained an inheritance in a name more excellent than they. God has spoken, my friends, and we are to believe uh, what he says. God not only has spoken, God continues to speak. His promises are forever. His promises are as real as the air that we breathe. Uh, we breathe the air, but we can't see it. But the reality of it being there is undeniable. We therefore can be confident, my friends, of what we hope for and convinced of what we do not see. As Hebrews 11 tells us, we have seen the word of God and it has told us, do not fear. We have seen the word of God that it brings faith. And the third and last thing we shall see, my friends, is what Elisha uh, shows us what we are to do when we're feeling helpless, what we are to do when we're feeling overwhelmed. And it's there in verse 17. Again, I bring it to you. Elisha prayed. Elisha prayed prayed. I, I, I make no apologies for speaking once again on prayer. Uh, the importance of prayer, my friends, is, is beyond um, sometimes what we, we would often discuss as the children of God. Faith which helps us not to fear. Faith which, uh, or the word which helps us not to fear, the word which helps us to bring faith is the same word that encourages us all the time. That when we are in those places, the natural progression as we go through things in life is prayer. Faith which encourages and helps us to pray. He prayed for the eyes of his servant to be opened. He prayed this, the, the spirit of his servant would be encouraged and strengthened and moved to stand firm upon the rock who was the God who is served, who was the Savior to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, he says, open his eyes that he may see. And this is the moment of true revelation for his servant, isn't it? As he comes to realize um, uh, uh, the truth. 
And it's the same thing for us, for those who, who worship God, for those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. My friends, it doesn't matter where we are in human history from the time of Adam. For those of us who are indwelt by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, the flesh, my friends, we are told, can never war uh, as it were, could never ever win the war against the Spirit. It's a wonderful thing to know. Even though we know our spirit is willing and our flesh is weak, we are told that in the weakness of our flesh, the strength of God is shown. And the, 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 the flesh cannot overcome the spirit of God. Here we find Elisha doing the greatest act of kindness that we could ever do in any situation, whether we are fearful or where we are faint-hearted for ourselves or for other people. The best thing we can do, my friends, the greatest thing that we can do is go to God in prayer. There is nothing better. There is nothing better than prayer that God's grace may strengthen. We pray that his light may shine in the darkness. We pray that the scales may be continually removed from the eyes. We pray so we can see him afresh every day. We pray, my friends, the clearer sight that we have of God through Jesus Christ, the more we see his power, the more we see his majesty, and the more we see his grace. It's the more that we see he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. God is greater. God will always be greater. All the servant could see as he looked with his natural eyes is a disaster. That's what he saw. Alas, master, what, what are we going to do? Look at this great army surrounding the city. But look what the word does. Look what Elisha says. The word by faith and very importantly, my friends, and more importantly, by prayer. Prayer was the engine that God used to give the servant sight, God's majesty is then revealed. It was at the behest of prayer that God reveals the truth to Elisha's servant. That's the wonder and blessing of prayer, my friends. Prayer works. Real prayer. Heartfelt prayer. Prayer from a transformed heart. And we saw last week, didn't we, from Timothy. There should be never, there should never be an I cannot pray from God's people. If we are that new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then there should always be a desire to pray. Because we are new, we are no longer what we were. We are now something different in the Lord. Lord, says the disciple, remember in Luke 11. Oh, you'd have to turn there. But if you remember, the disciple said, Lord, what did he ask? Teach us how to pray. Lord, he says, teach us. My friends, in everything we do concerning this faith in God, we need God to lead us and guide us. Teach us how to pray. The power, my friend, belongs to the Lord. The grace, my friends, belongs to the Lord. Everything is of the Lord. By prayer, the majesty and the glory of God is now revealed as the servant now witnesses this awesome sight of the heavenly host. And because of this revelation, his faith was reassured. And the word he was told was shown to be truth. Do not fear. He was no longer needed to be indeed afraid. Oh, you see verse 17. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And he saw. What did he see? Oh, he saw a wondrous sight, didn't he? The mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, guarding Elisha. Through prayer, the wonder of the spiritual had been opened up to the servant. Isn't that how God brings his word to our hearts? Isn't it through prayer, through mothers praying for their children, through uh, uh, congregations praying for others, through uh, brothers praying for their sisters, through uh, uh, people praying for leaders? Isn't it how that's how lives are transformed, my friends? The word of God and prayer. He now saw in a way that he had never seen before. He now truly had that new vision of God. In the hymn we sing, I saw a new vision of Jesus, my friends. I, I really pray that we all this night will have a new vision of Jesus. It is, my friends, 
uh, a word that says do not fear. It is a word that says, uh, that brings faith. It is a word that helps us to pray. And just look at the result. If we look at the application of all of what uh, has been said here, is the key of those words from Elisha in, this, in the middle of the story. Because what's the result of this word? What's the result of this faith? What's the result of this prayer? The servant's eyes are opened, and those who were the enemies were blinded. They ended up depending upon a man. We saw that, didn't we, in verse 19. Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek but he led them to Samaria he said this is not the way follow me he says here's a great um, lesson of danger they followed a man yes it was a man of God they listened to a man they trusted in man where did it get them my friends verse 20 tells us they opened their eyes uh, and there they were in in Samaria and, and there's a great picture, isn't there, of, of those in the world there. When we're in the world, we are blind, my friends. We're blind to the things of God. We see that God in his displeasure hardens hearts. God in his displeasure darkens eyes. And Romans reminds us, Romans 1.21, that tells us, Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That is what happens when men depend upon men, when men believe other men, when men tell others it's all about us, follow us, believe us, believe evolution, believe man's intelligence, believe, believe us, uh, atheists. There is no God. When men follow that pathway, when men listen to we are masters of our own destiny, uh, why friends, what are we shown in that picture at the end? With the servants, with the, the army being uh, uh, there in Samaria, they ended up in the last place in the world that they would have wanted to be. When God finally opens their eyes to the truth, they find themselves captured within the walls of Samaria. What a frightening message, my friends. It is frightening, but there's grace in it as well as I draw to a close. Because what it shows us is when men have been blindly walking through this world, following other men at no point, um, looking to God to open their eyes, there will come a point when God will open their eyes, but it will be too late. And they will be captive, as it were, within the walls of hell. But even in the, in, the, in, in the frightening nature of that message, there, there is grace because we can, we can thank God because it, there's also a wonderful picture of hope, isn't there? And grace. These men were captured. Verse 20, we saw them. They're in Samaria. Look at verse 21. The king of Israel saw them. He said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Are they deserving of death? Of course they are deserving of death. That's what sin is. The wages of sin is death. But what happens? Verse 22, you should not kill them, he says. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Here is hope and grace, my friends. A picture of it being given to us in this Old Testament uh, uh, passage. They were not killed as they probably deserved, but they were shown grace. They were not killed uh, as, as their sinful hearts should have been, in their blinded nature and blinded eyes should have been, but they were shown mercy. And they were fed, rested, and sent on their way. And I tell you, my friends, that's what God does every single day in the lives of people who don't know him. My friends... It, it, it is a frightening but yet wonderful picture. It, it, the way it contends against it, 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 uh, the lives of our, uh, us in the way God is with us. We deserve death through sin, through rejecting him, through being blind to him, through not wanting to know him. Yet every day we take a breath. Every day we wake up, he shows us grace. He shows us mercy. That's what he does for the unbelieving soul. But the warning is always there. The Lord is merciful, says Psalm 103, verse 8. 
He's merciful and he's gracious. He's slow to anger and he abounds in mercy, but he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever because he has not yet dealt with us, my friends, according to our sins, nor has he punished us according to our iniquities. You love the Lord? I tell you this evening, Elisha says, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I pray, as Elisha prayed, as someone once prayed for me, open his eyes, open her eyes, that they may see. That's the prayer of my heart for each and every one of us here this evening, Uh, especially those who may not know the Lord. But for you who does, I pray that you will know the wonder of God giving us the grace that we may not be afraid, that we may indeed um, have our eyes opened and truly have that new vision of Jesus. O Lord, our God, we do thank and praise you for being just a God of grace and a God of mercy, for being a God of, of, of salvation, for being a God who... Though, O God, you are angry with sin day by day, your mercy and your grace abound, and you continue to to pour out um, goodness upon a world who, in truth, does not deserve it. We thank you for those of us whose lives have been transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ, and we plead, O Lord God, for those who have not yet come to you. Open their eyes, O God, that they may see. Help us, O Lord, to live faithfully, remembering that for us whose eyes have been opened, we who have had that new vision of Jesus, we, O God, can live in that wonderful um, grace and mercy of knowing the Lord our God is good to us. May you bless us now and set our feet on a pathway of righteousness for another week in Jesus Christ's name we plead. Amen.